Hi there everyone, I'm Mark from Folkway Music. I hope you're all doing really well today. I'm here in my house with my own guitar because I just got myself a really fun new toy. It's this Shure MV88 Plus video kit. I love doing these videos, but I don't like post-production at all, which is why the audio quality of the videos that I've made over the last couple years has been questionable at best. So I've been looking for an easy way, plug and play with my iPhone to make a video, and I've got this new toy here and I'm pretty excited about it. So this is a test video. But I figured I'd make it kind of an interesting video. Because you guys never get to hear me play guitar. So I'm not gonna play guitar at you because I'm not actually a guitar player. There are many, many, many people who I would prefer to hear play guitar than myself. But, they're not here in my kitchen with me, and you are. So I figured I would take this moment and tell you about my Gibson L00. Everyone asks me about this thing. Through the years, Folkway has been known as an L00 kind of shop, and um, a vintage Gibson flat top kind of shop. And uh, a lot of the reason for that is this particular guitar. This is my 1933 L00. The factory order number is in the low 800s. And, um, and it's not in the best condition. It's been played an awful lot. There's a couple of repaired back cracks on it. But it's all original with the exception of the tuners, which are wartime tuners, and the nut, and the saddle. Of course, it's made, been made lefty. You can see I've filled and recut the saddle slot. Um, anyways. It's a special guitar, and I've played a lot of 1933 L00s, and some of them are super special. Most are very special, but some are not. And uh, so I've spent a lot of time measuring this guitar and measuring other guitars and looking at it and trying to figure out what exactly it is that this guitar's got going on that makes it sound so good, and what other guitars have going on that make them not sound quite as good. It's sound is such a, such a subjective thing. It's really hard to pinpoint like what about it is what makes it good, in quotes. But for me what it is, is that it's a guitar that is super thick and full on the trebles, even way up here. The mids are nice and full as well and, and, and supportive. But there's a ton of bass. It has near dreadnought kind of bass to it. And uh, how does that happen? How does a guitar, a double O size guitar, double O in Gibson and Martin speak kind of size guitar, develop such a bass response without compromising the trebles? It's rare to find a guitar that does both dreadnaughty bass and small guitar trebles. A small guitar that doesn't sound small and a big guitar that doesn't act big. So that's for me what makes it a great guitar. And I think Gibson kind of hit a sweet spot in 1933 after the 12 fret guitars, which were phenomenal small guitars all the air and reverb and overtones and smokiness that one can want on the guitar. Um, in between that and their 1934 and later guitars that were mid-range and punchy and loud, um, I kind of find that the nearest big guitar to this is a 1934 Jumbo. And uh, there are not that many of those around, unfortunately. So, Anyways, so some th certain things about this guitar, um, if you've been watching the videos that I've put out um, over these last few years, you'll know that the 33 guitars for a period had solid linings on the inside uh, instead, of kerf, instead of kerf linings. Um, the, I don't know if you, can, you can't see that in this video anyways, but the, the solid lining is very thin. It's an eighth of an inch thin and it goes around the whole perimeter at the top and the top is glued to it. So the top's gluing uh, glue surface is very small on these on these guitars with the with the solid lining 
And the solid lining is also stiff, so it imparts an extra stiffness to the sides. For me, I think that what that's doing, it's mostly adding about a half an inch worth of vibrating area on the top, because the kerf lining is about 3 eighths inch wide, and the solid lining is only an eighth of an inch wide, so there's an extra quarter of an inch of vibrating area. So it takes this guitar and makes it effectively a half an inch wider, which involves more of the top in sound production. Now a big guitar, a bigger guitar doesn't necessarily sound better. It's a system and there's a whole bunch of other things involved. But this guitar has the, the bigness going on, that extra half an inch of vibrating area is part of the magic, I think. Beyond that, I've measured the top thicknesses of a lot of these guitars and they're all over the place. Um, the, these guitars were sanded with a stroke sander, a big, huge belt sanding machine, and uh, the user would take this paddle and push down the sandpaper, which was kind of going in circles, and just use this flat paddle thing to sand over the guitar as the bed that the guitar was on moved. And um, it's an imprecise method. It's fast and it's great for factory, but it's imprecise. Um, and it resulted in guitars that were sanded in a kind of haphazard way. To my ear, the best sounding guitars that I've played are ones that are a little bit thicker here in the bridge area and thin out along the perimeter of the top, which makes sense. There's binding here, so you always have to sand a bit more around the edges to get the binding in check. Um, and then also the top thickness makes a big difference. So a lot of these LOOs from 34 and beyond, even some 33s, I've measured to be 125 or 128 thousandths of an inch in the bridge area. This guitar is 105 in the bridge area, and it tapers down to uh, anywhere from about 85 thousandths of an inch to 90, 95 thousandths of an inch around the perimeter. So it's a light top that feathers out to even lighter at the edges, which means the whole top can pump a lot more um, uh, with, like a loudspeaker, um, with sound energy. Um, the backs on these guitars are generally pretty flat in this plane. Um, they, they're 15, sort of a 15 foot radius and then a fold right here. And, and they're flatter down here than they are here, obviously. Tighter radius, flatter radius. And the flatness of the back also imparts some of the bass response. Um, and the small bridges, this bridge is an original bridge. Bridge plate's original, all that stuff's important. The top shape. Is, is lovely, it's got a nice arch to it, it's not caving in front of the bridge. Um, so it's strong enough to have held up, but not uh, too strong to have held up too well. And uh, there's not really any deformation, or much deformation in front. Um, keep in mind, I have worked on this guitar, so the pick guard has been re-glued, the bridge has been re-glued, the neck has been reset, the frets are redone, the nut and saddle are new. Um, numerous braces have been glued, all these cracks have been glued. So it's had a fair bit of work. Um, I think that has a lot to do with how come it sounds good. Um, the work was done and there's no weird old work that made the guitar not sound as good. But the frets are all seated properly, the nut is well fit, the saddle's well fit, it's glued in. All that stuff adds up to making a difference. The finish is, you know, not terribly thick. Anyways, they're all different, and some guitars also just, for whatever reason, sound better than others. And as you might imagine, doing this, this is year 23 for me, I've been able to choose the guitar that I wanted to keep, so I've chosen this one. And I really played this guitar and, and that one over there, um, which is, that's a, a gorgeous guitar, but it's something of a mongrel. Another repair person replaced the X-Brace on it long before I got to it. Did lots of repairs to it. They're perfectly well done, um, but uh, it's not a pure Gibson as a result. It has its sound and it has its look and its feel, and I love it for different reasons. This is the guitar that I play every time I pick up a guitar, mostly. And it's because of the sound that it's got and, and the feel of the neck. It's uh, something to be said also for these 33s. Um, the neck is a V-neck. Gibson started its, its V-shaped neck in 32 with its first 14 fret neck guitars. Um, and those earliest ones are not as heavy-duty V. They're not as chunky and as sharp a V as the later guitars. And this guitar has a lot of roundness in the V. So along the, uh, along the sides of the neck here, it's quite round here and here. So there's a lot that supports your hand. I like a round neck as a general rule. 
my 50s LG2 is my favorite neck, it's round. This neck I've gotten used to, even though it has a V, only because it's not phenomenally huge, and that V is not pointy and sharp. Um, so my hand is supported really well. I like wrapping my thumb around it. And I can still do that on this, on this guitar. I run light gauge strings on this. Um, these are a Darko, Martin made Darko lights. Phosphor bronze. I've tried lots of strings, and I always come back to these Darkos. In previous videos, I've said I like really dead strings. I like dead strings. I like them when they're sort of 75% dead these days. Your tastes all change, your pick changes, your ears change as you age. Um, I don't like new strings, but I, let, I like these Darkos. They've been on for a few months now, and I think they sound great. And uh, I run the action on this guitar at 5 to 5 64th, so it's lower than most, most people's guitars, on the bass side in particular. Our shop setup is 5 64th to 6 64th on the bass as a generic middle ground. Um, and for finger style players, we might go a little bit lighter. I like this 5 to 5 64th. It's the same setup that I have on my electric guitars. Because I want, I want the treble strings to have lots of thickness and fatness. I dig in pretty hard with my pick on the trebles and I use a heavy flat pick. Um, lower uh, high string action is going to give me more fret buzz, which is going to kill the notes, and I don't want that. I also like the feel of 564 in the bass. It's, it's comfortable and easy to play, and I'll take a little bit of fret buzz on my bass notes um, in trade for the playability of the 564. I can also do that because the frets are good on my guitar. If these were original vintage frets, I wouldn't be able to get away with that action. And have, and have a fairly clean bass response. So, uh, so that that necessitates good frets, which thankfully I know how to do. Um, but string gauge setup, saddle height, the proximity of the saddle to the bridge pins, the break angle over the nut of the strings. All that stuff makes a big difference to how your guitar actually sounds. I can make this guitar be completely lousy sounding um, just by changing how I wrap the strings. Maybe not completely lousy sounding, that's maybe an exaggeration, but I can make it sound very different by changing how I wrap the strings on, on the tuners. I want those strings to go fairly low on the tuners uh, to allow more break angle over the nut. The more break angle and downward pressure there is on the nut, the more the nut and the neck are being engaged in the sound of your guitar. Another interesting thing is just the placement of a truss rod. Um, the, the neck involvement and, and the neck's damping of the, the sound of your guitar is greatly affected by where the truss rod is in terms of its engagement. And simply playing with the truss rod makes a big difference to the sound of an instrument. If your truss rod is all the way loose on a guitar like this, on a one-way truss rod, you, you can get some vibration in your neck that's going to do a lot to uh, absorb sound, which you don't want. Um, so when you do a refret, when someone like me does a refret, it's very important that I set the neck, that if it has a truss rod, to where I want it to be relative to how I want that truss rod to be engaged, and then do the refret. Um, and I, I largely think of these as a, as a guitar that the truss rod never gets touched once it's set. If you maintain your humidity constant, you can keep your, uh, your truss rod where it is. I don't think I've ever touched this truss rod, but I work pretty hard at keeping my guitar's living environment, you know, in the, in the low 40% relative humidity. Um, ditto with the fit of the bridge pins, um, and uh, in the case of this guitar, there's a couple extra ball ends on the bass strings to keep the wound part of the, the string off of the saddle. The saddle is bone. Um, the saddle material, of course, makes a big difference. A bigger difference is made by if the saddle is uh, properly fit, number one, and then glued in place. So this saddle is, uh, it was a fresh saddle slot, of course, because I'm left-handed, and the original was filled, and then I recut it at a lefty angle. And so it was a perfect saddle slot, perfectly flat, perfectly square, and the saddle that I made is perfectly flat and square, and, and then it's glued in with hide glue. And, uh, and it's not too tall, um, and so all that has a 
marked effect on sound. If the saddle was taller, there would be more power and volume, but less smokiness and, and subtle overtones. And if the saddle was lower, you, I would have less power. These wouldn't be as powerful, um, but they would be even more smoky and, and overtone heavy. So a heavier built guitar with um, a tall saddle is great for a heavy flat picker who wants clarity and fundamental presence. A heavily built guitar with a low saddle is great for a softer touch person uh, who wants all those overtones. A lightly built guitar with a tall saddle could just be maybe a little too shrill, but with a medium height saddle, this is not a low saddle, it's pretty, pretty standard and medium height, um, sort of captures the best of all worlds. The fret wire is just standard Martin wire on this guitar. I'm getting close to needing a refret. There's bit of a sitari noise gap happening on my G note on the high E string because I play G chords a lot. Um, but uh, you know, it'll get there. I'll get there when I get there. Anyways, thanks for watching. I hope this has been somewhat interesting. I'm interested to press stop and listen to the video and see what this new Shure microphone setup sounds like. I think it's going to be a big improvement to these videos and make them much more exciting for me to actually do. Anyways, take care. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.